And what of modern ships? Well, this is myself at Cowshot with Queen Mary II sailing past on her way to New York, the ship that I designed. So is Queen Mary II any safer than Titanic? Well, a lot of people don't realize that Queen Mary II only actually came about because of the Titanic. Because the wreck of the Titanic was discovered by Robert Ballard from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Center in September 1985. And that caused a tremendous upsurge in interest in Titanic. And that also, of course, was highlighted again when James Cameron's movie Titanic came out in 1997. And at that stage, Cunard was running the Queen Elizabeth II or the QE2 across the Atlantic. And that film caused such a huge surge of interest in transatlantic crossings that suddenly QE2 was sailing full. And that spurned Carnival, the Carnival Corporation, to buy Cunard and invest in the building of a new transatlantic ship, of which I, I was put in charge of. And so Queen Mary II was ordered on the 6th of November 2000 on the back of this upsurge in interest caused by the Titanic. Now, the Queen Mary II, from a volumetric point of view, which is the way we measure passenger ships, a gross ton is a hundred cubic feet of enclosed space inside a passenger ship. She's 150,000 gross tons compared to Titanic's 45,000. So she's actually three times the size of the Titanic. She's powered by diesel electric and gas turbine electric engines of 86 megawatts of power. So she has considerably more than the Titanic's 34 megawatts. The installed power is 118 megawatts compared to just over 35 on Titanic. And she actually weighs 76,000 tons compared to Titanic's 53,000. She's considerably faster at 29.65 knots compared to 22 on Titanic. She can carry more passengers, but crucially, she is much more maneuverable you can turn Queen Mary II around very, very quickly. And the propulsion system is much more fast acting than the turbines and the reciprocating engines of the Titanic. And the introduction of safety of life at sea, an international group of regulations from maritime nations spurned on by the loss of the Titanic, set international standards for subdivision and flooding and stability. And of course, there was also much more emphasis on monitoring ice with an international ice patrol. And this is now undertaken with ships aeroplanes and satellites. Certainly technology wasn't available at the time of the Titanic. Titanic was built long before radar was introduced, which is what we have these days on, on the ships. And we're constantly updating these rules and regulations. And the latest rules for passenger ships, the so-called safe return to port, means that if you have a major incident on a passenger ship in one section of the ship, one group of compartments, you've got to demonstrate that the ship can still return back to port unaided. And you have to design that redundancy into the ship, something that certainly was inconceivable with the design of the Titanic. So I'd like to finish 
today with a tale about a book, a book called Futility that was brought out in 1898. And it was written by a gentleman called Morgan Robertson, and he called his book Futility. And he wrote about a 70,000 ton ocean liner with three propellers, just like the Titanic, traveling at 24 knots. So a little bit faster, but very, very similar to Titanic. Just like Titanic, he set his ship off on a maiden voyage in an April. And again, like Titanic, the ship had insufficient lifeboats for everybody on board. And would you believe it? Morgan sank his ship by striking it into an iceberg. And this is 1898, some 14 years before the Titanic was built. And he called his ship Titan. And White Star Line named all their ships with an IC. So when you think Titan, when you put it in the White Star nomenclature, it becomes Titanic. So that was 14 years before the actual disaster. And it was written about by Morgan Robertson in his book. So Titanic conceived in 1908 to challenge the Cunard ships, sank on a maiden voyage, huge interest even today, 2021. But the most important thing about the Titanic disaster was that the 1,500 odd people that perished on board the ship during that fateful night in April 1912, those lives were not lost in vain because it's from that that we have all the rules and regulations that now makes passenger shipping one of the safest modes of transport there is today. So ladies and gentlemen, it's been a real pleasure to talk about the Titanic, to dispel some of the myths about that she was substandard or that it was the Olympic that sank and to give you a comparison with a modern day ship like my Queen Mary II, and I certainly look forward to answering your questions. Thank you all very much. Hello everybody, and welcome to the Q&A session for the Titanic lecture. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. My name is Stephen Payne. I'm the Naval Architect of the Queen Mary II, and I'm here to answer the questions for the next few minutes. So let's start off with the first question. Can you recommend the most accurate and comprehensive book available on the Titanic? Well, there's an enormous variety of books, but probably the most comprehensive is a two set volume. This one, Titanic, the Ship Magnificent, two volumes, very expensive goes into every detail of the design and construction. If you don't want to splash out for that, then Robert Ballard's book, The Guy That Discovered the Wreck, very informative, lots of information about um, how the Titanic sank and the design and construction. And then other books such as this, um, Mark Churn's side, the Olympic, Titanic, Britannic, but there, there's a huge number of books out there covering all budgets and different complexities. 